Coal miners in one community, they've been on strike now for months. Working as long as 12 hours a day, seven days a week, in some of the most dangerous conditions. I really think that the labor movement is the single greatest force for democracy in the history of the United States. The story of Alabama is a story of not just resilience, but of militancy. I say no contract, you say no. You're listening to Alabama's only union talk radio show, The Valley Labor Report, with Adam Keller and Jacob Morrison. Hello, Tennessee Valley. This is The Valley Labor Report. My name is Jacob Morrison, here with my co-host and fellow agitator, Adam Keller, and we are broadcasting live to tape. Online and on the radio from the heart of the Tennessee Valley, the Spice Radio Studio in Huntsville, Alabama. Today, Hyundai gets a real penalty for using child labor. OSHA is investigating Amazon in Huntsville. We talk about how to beat apathy in your workplace and more on today's program. If you want to be part of the show today, well... That's going to be a problem because this is a recorded episode. We are down in Montevallo, Alabama right now at the Labor Notes Alabama Troublemakers School. But we do still have a phone number and the line is still open. So if you have thoughts, questions, or comments during today's show, you can call or text and leave us a voicemail and we might respond on the next show. That phone number is 844-899-TVLR. That is 844-899-8857. If you haven't gotten enough of us by the time that we wrap here on the radio, or if you just want to see what we're up to throughout the week, then you can find us online. Uh, We're anywhere you find anything online. We are on TikTok, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, wherever you get your podcasts. Just search for The Valley Labor Report and you'll be able to find us. Just a reminder, your support helps us stay on the air. Our largest single source of funding comes directly from our listeners. So if you want to become a sustaining member of the program, make a one-time donation, buy our hat or our stickers, you can go to our website, tvlr.fm, or become a patron at patreon.com slash Report. If you're a member of a union, you should see about getting your local, your state council, your international federation to sponsor the program. We really appreciate our union sponsors, and we couldn't do it without them either. So we're going to jump right into last week in Southern Labor and go through uh, what's been going on. Last Week in Southern Labor is a segment that we do every week, mostly, where we talk about what happened in the labor movement in the South. We pull the information from Jonah Furman's newsletter, Who Gets the Bird?, which compiles all this information for the entire United States. So if you want to see what's going on outside the South, then you should subscribe to said newsletter. That is whogetsthebird.substack.com. With that, let's jump into new organizing for the week of October 2nd through October 8th. And we'll start with a big picture uh, from the NLRB's recent report on its past fiscal year, which just ended. New filings are up 53% over last year, and ULP filings are up 19% from last year. ULPs are unfair labor practice charges. So it is really true that we are in the middle of an uptick in NLRB activity, but it's important to note that there were more filings in 2016 than in the past year, and that was no high watermark. One way, according to Jonah, to think about what's happening is that pre-pandemic, we were at the beginning of a rising tide 
of union activity. 2018, with the mass teacher strikes, was the strikingest year since 1986, and October 2019 had far more workers on strike than in so-called striketober of 2021. So one way to look at this is that we were in the middle of a rising tide of union activity pre-pandemic that was interrupted by COVID and is now resuming. Maybe the biggest takeaway from the NLRB report is that they have lost half of their field staff in the last 20 years and have had stagnant funding for the past nine That's important because if we're going to route new union activity through an administrative bureaucracy, it being under-resourced is going to become a really, really big problem. Also, two respiratory service techs at the U.S. Army post in Redstone Arsenal, Alabama are joining Operating Engineers Local 320. Charlottesville, Virginia is the latest public sector jurisdiction in Virginia to pass a collective bargaining law combined with a raise for bus drivers. In Alexandria, Virginia, where a similar ordinance was passed a year and a half ago, nearly 200 city workers are now members of AFSCME Local 3001. Elsewhere in the public sector, the National Park Service is facing a complaint from AFGE that management illegally initiated the decertification of a unit of workers along the Blue Ridge Parkway in Virginia and North Carolina. We only had one win last week, and that was 78 truck drivers for wholesale beverage distributor Republic in Houston, Texas, voting 55 to 12 to join Teamsters Local 988. Lots of strikes and bargaining updates. First up, the rail negotiations that just three weeks ago were national headlines have slowed to a trickle of news by design, but are not yet over. This week's small update is that a fourth of the dozen rail unions has voted to ratify their tentative agreement, and uh, with the ATDA voting by 64% to accept the deal. We're getting results from three more unions this week, with the Brotherhood of Maintenance and Way employees having voted since the newsletter came out to reject the agreement, which is a very big deal. Members of that union have set a strike deadline uh, slightly after the midterm elections. Members are still raising questions about the process so far, with at least one local chairman in the Machinists District Lodge 19 writing a scathing letter to that union's leadership about the process. Male prisoners across Alabama continue to refuse work to push for reforms of living conditions, life sentencing, parole, and time served. 450 steelworker members at West Rock's Cottonton, Alabama mill are still locked out. The workers rejected a a contract offer with an eye-watering $28,000 ratification bonus as they hold out for penalties for excessive overtime. This week also marked 18 months on the picket line for UMWA strikers at Warrior Met, and Erica Willis wrote about it for Labor Notes. You should check that out. Star Starbucks Workers United went on strike in Houston, Texas against the national firing wave and in Columbia, South Carolina for the company's unilateral decision to drop COVID isolation pay. 400 workers at Graphic Packaging in Domino, Texas with steelworkers Local 1148 and 1149 authorized a strike against two-tier pay back in June over a contract that expired back in April, but the union says a strike is still not imminent. Elsewhere in large grocery contracts, something like 17,000 Teamsters will be voting on the first ever national Costco contract. Yet another airline contract has been submitted for federal mediation, this time that of the Airline Pilots Association pilots at FedEx Express. This is somewhere between checking a box and declaring a light impasse, but it's worth tracking for sure. 
in political fights. Dave Jameson at the Huffington Post has a very useful piece breaking down what's at stake in Glacier Northwest, which is the case the Supreme Court just announced it plans to hear during this session. In the most dire reading, we could be headed towards a scenario in which private sector unions are liable for damages incurred by an employer during a strike which, depending on how you slice it, would basically make effective strikes impossible since the vast majority of the leverage workers hold is in, is in inflicting economic pain on employers. Of course. The NLRB also ruled this week that dues checkoff provisions should be considered part of the status quo that cannot be unilaterally changed once a contract expires. So that's a little bit of good news to contrast with the potentially world-ending news (laughs) from the Supreme Court. We get a mention in the newsletter this week. He says the Valley Labor Report had researcher Chris Boner on to talk about his fantastic report, Labor's Fortress of Finance. Boner's report is one of the rare, wide-ranging, deeply researched critical takes on the labor movement as a whole that both activists and leadership alike should take a long, hard look at. And finally, in internal union politics, the UFCW reform effort, Essential Workers for a Democratic UFCW has launched with a new website with lots of resources on their diagnosis of what the union's getting wrong and a slate of resolutions they hope to pass at the 2023 convention. And with that, we're going to talk about the uh, the next story, which is that Hyundai has been fined $65,000 for employing children in Alabama. (laughs) You folks know that we've been tracking this uh, child labor story here in Alabama pretty closely, and we have a pretty big update for you this week. One of, only one, but one of the Hyundai suppliers that has been recently found to be employing children in Alabama has been penalized by both the U.S. and the Alabama Departments of Labor for a total of approximately $65,000, as far as I can tell. The Alabama Department of Labor said in their press release on Tuesday, two businesses, SL Alabama LLC and JK USA, were issued fines of $17,800 each for multiple violations of the child labor law in Alabama. JK USA, if you'll remember, was the staffing agency for SL Alabama, which employs people in Alexander City outside of Mobile down in South Alabama. That amounted to total a little more than $35,000. The U.S. Department of Labor, more interestingly, said in their own statement that they had fined and been paid by SL Alabama $30,000 as well. But here's the more interesting thing. Here's the kicker. And, and I, think, I think, frankly, the only thing of substance, right? Because $65,000, which is the total that's being paid by these varied parties to these varied institutions, the U.S. Department of Labor and the Alabama Department of Labor, $65,000, not a lot of money to a company, uh, to a company like Hyundai, which saw $4.6 billion, with a B, $4.6 billion in profit in 2021. In profit, profit is, let's remember, uh, profit is what you have left over after you've finished paying everybody everything. You've paid your fancy executives all their millions of dollars. You've paid your thousands of employees. You've paid everything. All of this profit is what's left over after you've paid all of your expenses. Expenses. $4.6 billion in profit. And 100 billion, 100 billion in revenue in 2021. Right? So when we're talking about $65,000 in comparison to those two numbers, it is quite literally a fraction of 1%. A fraction of a fraction of a percent of their profit in 2021. $65,000. Not a lot. Just the slap on the wrist, right? It would be, that type of penalty would be like 
literal pennies to a normal person like you and me. But here is the thing that I think is not nothing from the U.S. Department of Labor, not the Alabama Department of Labor, but from the U.S. DOL press release, in addition to the civil penalties that SL Alabama has to pay, SL Alabama is forbidden from shipping any goods produced within 30 days of a child labor violation. SL Alabama must provide training materials to employees and subcontractors or other entities that provide workers to the Alexander City site to ensure child labor standards must uh, to ensure child labor standards compliance. SL Alabama must hire a third-party company to provide quarterly child labor trainings to all management personnel and subcontractors for a three-year period, and SL. Alabama must impose sanctions, including termination or suspension, on any management or subcontractors found responsible for child labor violations. Now, these these seem like real penalties here, especially, especially that first one, not being able to ship any goods produced within 30 days of the violation. So just, you know, I'm reading this, just reading this as a layman, right? I'm just a normal working person, just like you. I work my nine to five and I go home and I try to fight for workers' rights too. But, and, and so I have some working understanding of the law. Um, but this is just my understanding is that we are looking at a minimum, a minimum, which I, I would think that it's going to be more than this, but we're looking at a minimum of two months, 60 days worth of production from the whole facility just has to be scrapped. Just has to be scrapped. And I say a minimum of two months because let's say, let's say if the violation only happened on one day, which that would be bizarre to only employ these children for one day, right? That would be a bizarre thing. Presumably this, this has been going on for a while. But let's say, but but maybe they only were able to to nail them down on one day. If that was the case, then what they're saying is that they're forbidden from shipping any goods produced within 30 days of a child labor violation. That's 30 days uh, uh, to and from, right? There's a 30 day radius from the from the violation. So we could be looking at uh, at a minimum a minimum of 60 days worth of production from this facility that just has to be scrapped. Now that sounds like a lot, you know, so I I I just I have to wonder if I'm if I'm misinterpreting this somehow because you know bosses never have bosses always only get slaps on the wrist. Corporations always only get slaps on the wrist. And I know that we've got labor lawyers that listen to us. So, you know, please do let me know if I'm missing something here. But that's how this re- release reads to me. And I also tweeted this out. I tweeted that paragraph of the press release from the U.S. Department of Labor and tagged a couple of labor lawyers that I follow on Twitter. And, and they concurred with my layman's reading of it. Uh, they said that that's, that's what it looks like to them. So, you know... That's pretty good. I think that's a reasonable economic penalty for for using child labor. Um, This is for, and and these penalties are for, per the Alabama Department of Labor, the determination that SL Alabama had employed three minors aged 15, 15, and 15 in a prohibited manufacturing environment. All three minors were provided by JKUSA, a temporary employment agency, but were performing work at SL Alabama. The miners were operating plastic bonding machines in a prohibited occupation and location. Um, so as far as the economic penalties go, I'm, I'm pretty happy about this. Uh, I think that's a, that's a reasonable resolution. The only other thing that we need to see is a few people marched out in handcuffs. And I think, (laughs) and I think that that's, that's a pretty good resolution to, to this facility. Um, and, and, and yes, I do think if we're going to be, if we are going to be, uh, putting people in prison, 
we're going to be putting people in prison for all sorts of things? Absolutely. 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 The, the managers, the executives who signed off on this agency, absolutely, they should be, uh, they should be walked away in handcuffs. I'm not saying they should, uh, they should go to the jail for the rest of their lives. Just for this, I'm sure that, I'm sure that you know, you give me, you you uh, give investigators enough time, and they can find some other things that they violate, some other laws that they violated. But but absolutely, I think they should do jail time if poor people are going to do jail time for much less. Um, I do also want to mention that uh, that given my coverage of this situation, I would not be honest if I did not mention that both press releases did call out the Alabama Attorney General's office as people who helped conduct the investigation. But there is still nothing from Marshall directly on this. And if he wanted, he could pursue criminal charges. He could be the one to make sure that the people responsible do actually get walked away in handcuffs for this. And I think that, that is, that's what would be warranted. Um, I still ma- maintain that he will probably not do that. I don't believe that this is something that his, even what's happened now, I don't think is something that his office is going to be touting. We haven't seen anything from him on Twitter or um, on the Alabama Attorney General's website. I'd love to be proven wrong. As, you know, credit where it's due, if there was, if, if there were some people uh, who were not total monsters <laughs> in the office of the Alabama who, Attorney General's office who actually did help conduct this investigation and helped make sure that these charges were levied against SL Alabama. I appreciate your work. We are still waiting on resolution for the situation first reported by reported by Reuters about a Hyundai subsidiary outside of Montgomery that is confirmed to have employed two or three miners and potentially as many as 50. So we'll keep you up to date on what happens there. Uh, last news story, and then we will uh, talk about what, what's going on down south in Montevallo um, about the, uh, the Labor Notes Alabama Troublemaker School. Way 31, W-A-A-Y 31 in Huntsville is reporting that OSHA has opened an investigation into the Amazon facility in Huntsville that caught fire twice in as many weeks, most recently about a week and a half ago. Fortunately, no one was hurt in either fire, but WAFF 48 in Huntsville is reporting that workers are beginning to feel distrustful of their employer as a result of this. And yeah, rightfully so. (laughs) And I do hope that some of them are in touch with one of the entities that is organizing Amazon workers, whether that be RWDSU down in Bessemer, Alabama, or the Amazon Labor Union, which recently announced a campaign in, where was it? Somewhere in California, Fresno. One of the facilities in California just announced that they were filing for an election with the Amazon Labor Union, and there is currently an election slated to begin shortly at an Albany, New York Amazon facility. So hopefully one of these Huntsville workers are in touch with one of the unions that is organizing Amazon workers because... Amazon's not going to protect you, and most likely OSHA will not either. But we did just see a real penalty doled out by the U.S. Department of Labor to a Hyundai supplier using child labor in Alabama. So maybe, maybe, maybe we'll see a real penalty from OSHA for putting Alabama workers in a fire hazard twice in as many weeks. So we'll see. We'll keep you updated on that one as well. We're going to go ahead and take a break. On the other side, we are going to be talking about how to assemble your dream team at work when you're organizing your workplace. How do you form an organizing committee? How do you form an organizing committee? We're going to be talking about that with Isaac Standridge. Uh, and this is one of the workshops that we're going to, that is happening, is actually happening right now. As you're listening to this live on the radio... And online, if you're listening to us online. But as you're listening to us live on the radio, Isaac Standridge and Luis Leon are giving a training to dozens of unionists from Alabama about how to assemble an organizing committee. 
how to assemble a workplace committee uh, to make change on the job, uh, to, to affect change on the job. So, so that's what we're going to be doing on the other side of this break. Uh, stay tuned. You're listening to the Valley Labor Report. Hometown Action is a grassroots organization building a multiracial working class movement for racial, gender, economic, and environmental justice in Alabama's rural communities. We stand in solidarity with Alabama workers and are proud to support the Valley Labor Report's efforts to inform and build the Southern Worker Movement. Please visit hometownaction.org and follow our social media channels at Hometown Action to learn more about how you too can get involved to make the South a better place for all workers. Solidarity, y'all. IBW 558 is like a great football team. You've got to have the aptitude, skills, and knowledge to outperform the competition. If you're a non-union electrician, now is the perfect time to get off the sideline and join our team. We have the absolute best wages and benefit package in North Alabama and Southern Tennessee. It's because our team stands together, bargains together, and our families benefit from it. With immediate openings, you have the opportunity to see why the IBW is the right choice. Energy Alabama is a locally operated and membership-based nonprofit organization focused on advancing Alabama's clean energy future through education and advocacy. Many people in charge of infrastructure and building decisions simply don't know about how viable clean and renewable energy is. To that end, Energy Alabama has provided instruction to more than thousands of adults and tens of thousands of K-12 students across the state. We're working hard to build careers in clean energy and help everyday Alabamians save money on their utility bills. Learn more about our work and how you can join us at energyalabama.org. Support for the Valley Labor Report comes from the International Federation of Professional and Technical Engineers Union. Learn more by visiting www.ifpte.org. The attorneys at Maples, Tucker & Jacobs have stood with the working people of Alabama for over 40 years, providing skilled legal representation for your workplace injury claims. When you are injured on the job, it can be a scary time. The attorneys at Maples, Tucker & Jacobs have the experience to guide you through the process to make sure that you and your family are properly taken care of and your rights are protected. If you need help, call the attorneys at Maples, Tucker & Jacobs at 855-617-9333 or visit online at www.mtnj.com. No representation is made that the quality of legal services provided is greater than the quality of legal services provided by other law firms. Support for this program comes from the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 136, out of Central Alabama. Learn more at IBEW136.org. Attention union members, membership organizations, podcasters, or anyone with a payment processing need. The future is here, and your organization needs to be prepared by working with Unionly. With Unionly, your union or organization can take payments on a mobile device, eliminating processing fees, giving you a better price than other payment processing methods, while at the same time supporting a union-friendly business with a specialized skill set to meet your needs. Your members will thank you when they pay their dues at their convenience without waiting in line to deposit cash or check. Start preparing for the future today by calling 206-595-8631 or visiting unionly.io. Are you looking for a better future, a career that can have you set for life, and to be a part of something that's bigger than yourself? If you are, then consider a skilled trades apprenticeship with the International Union of Painters and Allied Trades. The work of IUPAT is all around us, from the industrial painters who work on the bridges to drywall finishers, floor coverers, the glazers who install the glass in our skylines, and so much more. With an IUPAT apprenticeship, you earn while you learn and receive benefits while learning the trade, including a pension. We provide world-class education free of charge. That's right, no student debt. Our starting salaries for apprentices that graduate is above the national median salary with benefits for entire families. And you have the flexibility to take your trade wherever you'd like in the country to work. IUPAT District Council 77 covers our entire region, so give Adam Booth a call at 205-603-3142 for more information. Again, that phone number is 205-603-3142. Come build a better future with us today and join IUPAC. Come on, you poor workers, good news to you, I'll tell how the good old union has come in your town. 
All righty, folks, welcome back. You are listening to the Valley Labor Report, Alabama's only union talk radio show. My name is Jacob Morrison. Adam Keller is not with me for this interview, but we are live to tape online and on the radio from the heart of the Tennessee Valley, the Spice Radio Studio in Huntsville, Alabama. And we are joined by Isaac Standridge. He is a member of the Alabama Professional Staff organization. And what we are doing with uh, this show is we're talking to several people uh, from from several panels, from several several workshops, uh, from the Labor Notes Alabama Troublemaker School that is happening right now as this is airing. Uh, and we're doing that so that we can kind of give people a taste of what they're missing, give people, you know, some some helpful information. Um, and so we wanted to talk to Isaac about one of the workshops that he is leading with Luis Leon about assemb- uh, co- titled Assembling Your Dream Team. Isaac, uh, thanks for taking the time with us this afternoon. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Jacob. It's good to be with you. And I'm You know, we've been working on getting this Alabama Troublemaker School going uh, for the past several months. Uh, I've enjoyed that process and and know that um, this training is going to be really good. I think it will. I think it will. Um, There are several really good um, there are several really good workshops, really good panelists. And like Joe emphasized, Joe Demanuel Hall emphasized last week on the show, you know, I think the important thing is, and this is something that you mentioned, is is the popular education aspect, the the ability to learn from one another, whether or not you're actually um, you're actually, you know, quote unquote, leading a panel or facilitating a, a workshop the ability to, um, you know, to learn from fellow attendees and to network and to build relationships and stuff like that. So I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to that aspect of, of the thing as well. So, um, so your, your panel is titled assembling your dream team. So talk to us about, about that. What, what are we going to be, um, what are we going to be learning in your, in your workshop? Great. So yeah, assembling your dream team actually comes out of, the hallmark training that Labor Notes is known for. It's called Secrets of a Successful Organizer. Um, Assembling your dream team is the second unit of that training. Um, So it all comes out of this textbook, Secrets of a Successful Organizer. Um, And and assembling your dream team, uh, like you said, it's about popular education. I'm not an expert in the room. I can share stories of Uh, organizing experiences that I've had and everyone else in the room can share the same. This particular training is broken up into two major sections. The first section will be kind of exploring uh, why leaders are important, who the leaders are, what it means to be a leader. Uh, And then the second half will be how is your uh, workplace already organized, right? And mapping kind of those organizational structures that already exist in your workplace, identifying the leaders that already exist in your workplace, even if they, you know, don't have a title or position or anything like that. We'll talk about natural uh, leaders that exist in your workplace, within your unions, or if you don't yet have a union that already exists there. So no, when you're organizing, you're not, no one's ever starting at level zero. There already exists an organizational structure. There already exists a way of, um, workers relating to one another. Um, so in this um, workshop, we'll be exploring that deeper. And uh, we're actually going to be able to get Luis on the line here shortly. He just texted me and said that he's going to be able to join to talk to us about this uh, as well. But let's start with, um, you know, you said that your your workplace is already organized. Your workplace is already organized. So what what do you mean by that? What what does what does labor notes mean when they say that? What do you mean when you say that? Yeah, so there's two kind of ways to think about it that we'll kind of go over in this training. Uh, one way is to think about the work order. How is your workplace already structured? What is the order that already exists? Right. So an easy way to think about this is: Does your workplace have different departments? 
Does it have different grade levels? Like, it, you know, if you're in a school system, does it have different department, you know, um, different shifts, right? Are you on first shift, second shift, third shift? So there's already a structure in place that groups people into these teams or um, working collaborative groups that work in close contact with each other. So that's the work order that already exists. Um, and in most places, that work order has been designed by the employer or the boss, right? Um, but it does exist. So how do we work within that structure that currently exists? And then the second way to think about it is what are, what are, what's the social order of your workplace? What are the social relationships that exist there? Are people related to one another? Do they have family that works there? Do they have people that they go to attend places of worship with together? Um, do people carpool? So just kind of identifying those social relationships that already exist and working from there as well. Um, and that's particularly important when we think about questions of why do we need leaders, right? Or what is a leader? So one of the common responses you'll get when you ask someone who a leader is or what a leader is, they may identify people in positions of leadership and say they're a leader, right? Or they may identify, um, you know, there's lots of books about how to be a leader, right? Stephen Covey, those kind of things, right? Um, but that's not exactly what we're talking about here. For the purpose of labor notes, we begin to think about all the different aspects of a leader and just really come away with one key idea. And that key idea is that leaders have followers. It, and if you don't have a follower, if, if, if there aren't followers, then there may not be a leader. But there are leaders in your workplace already. They already have people that they can call on, um, that they have these social relationships with. And, you know... Uh, so there were a couple of good things there that that um you know are are important to touch on I think and one of those things as we uh, as we welcome as we welcome Louise maybe we can we can just go ahead and and jump and and uh, get him to answer a question just right off the bat just throw him into the deep end. <laughs> good thanks Jacob. Yeah, absolutely. Love pe love putting people on the spot. Um, yeah, so, you know, we've been talking, Luis, about, you know, we, we've been talking for a couple of minutes already about uh, the the training and how your workplace is already organized. And, and he, he's, he, he was going through basically how your workplace is already organized. There are different departments. There are, you know, different sections of the workplace physically and socially. And there's also social relationships that, that can... Uh, can or cannot be uh, used by the boss or by your coworkers, and so you know the question that I was going to ask Ad, uh, as Isaac, and now I'll ask you is why is it important to understand um, how your workplace is organized already? Right. So, um, do you, you want me to take that, Isaac, and then you you can chime in? Um, yeah, go ahead. I was just talking about. You know, the work order and then the social order. Um, right, right. And how to, how to grow from that. Yeah. Yeah. I think one reason why it's important to think about, about, uh, about how our workplaces are already organized is because sometimes in organizing, we think about someone is coming out from the outside, they're organizing the workers. It's like, there's no organization here. We have to build it. So the idea is, I think a respect for the agency of the people that we're working with to improve our workplaces, that they already have set up a way to undermine the boss, to make it possible to exist in an exploitative workplace. So our, the, the notion that your workplace is already organized is like, how do you tap into that network of uh, resistance that already exists in your workplace and it may not be obvious, you know, that that network is already there. It could be, um, you know, who who are the people that that you go to if you want to get something done? Who has a good relationship with a supervisor that plays favoritism, right? Um, so that's someone that you want to be aware of in case they're on the side of management and are going to snitch on you once you start organizing. <laughs> <laughs> so the right. idea is that you're not entering the workplace as this empty vacuum that you're going to fill in with leaders. They're already mm. leaders there. 
those leaders are either on the side of management or they're on the side of other workers fighting to improve their workplace. Our task is to identify what those dynamics are so that we can play offense when it's necessary or we can, you know, play defense when it's necessary. So that's just information that will help us build a strong committee of workers. Um, so that that's my sense of it. But I'm curious what you think, Isaac, in your experience. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. Um, and, you know, this training is kind of, it comes, it's the second step after beating apathy, right? So, um what we learn in that is that there are issues that and concerns that everybody has, right? Or things that people care about. They may not I call them an issue yet or anything like that, but there's things that people care about. And only through understanding those relationships can you find out what people care about, right? So if we, if we start with the structure that already exists and work with those relationships that already exist, then we may be able to find out as we move, as we progress forward. Um, so one, one, one thing that I often think about is you may not be the person in your workplace that's going to win over another person, right? So you have to identify the relationships that already connect that person and they may be able to win them over in ways that you just can't. Right. That's a great point. I, I totally agree with that. I think it's knowing, like having the humility to know I'm not the leader of this group of people, mm -hmm. right? There are multiple leaders in our workplaces and some folks will identify with us and listen to us when we speak. But at Labor Notes, we like to say that a leader is someone who has followers. It's a very simple understanding of um, leadership. And sometimes it kind of goes against our, our culture where we glamorize people that are eloquent or we glamorize the loud mouths. But in reality, um, what we want is people that can move their coworkers to take action. So I was just on a call before jumping onto this uh, uh, interview with a worker at Amazon in California. And this worker was a learning ambassador. And he was describing to me the process about, of how he came to become disillusioned with Amazon and became uh, a militant in his workplace fighting for change. And as a learning ambassador, he was training other workers on how to do their jobs. And he felt like he was being dishonest and selling them lies um, in, in his current role. And for me, someone like that, he came across as a very charismatic person, as someone that was funny that workers could identify with. Like I had fun just talking to him as an interviewer. <laughs> so um, that's not always the case in interviews. Um, uh, so there's, the secret is out. Um, like sometimes people are very shy, you know, and they, they just are not comfortable. Or they're just giving you canned lines about things. Um, but it's always great when you have an interview and people just open up. So this person really opened up and shared some really good stuff um, that I hope to include in an article. Um, and so my thought was, as I was listening to him, I'm like, wow, this is someone that when he flipped over and became disillusioned with Amazon and began organizing, he already had a network of people that looked up to him because he had trained them, right? And we saw that mm -hmm. dynamic with uh, uh, Chris Smalls in, um, in Staten Island, uh, Derek Palmer. These were people that had been at the facility for a long time had helped other workers out when they were learning the ropes. And because of those relationships, they were able to mobilize them once they started trying to build a union. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, uh, that's key. So, you know, as you know, you're talking about the workplace is already organized and how do we recognize leaders? Um, why, and why is it important to, you know, it's important to recognize leaders basically so that we can get them on the committee, right? Like we want we want to bring them and then their followers onto an organizing committee uh, to so that they can they can begin leading with you know with with 
me in my workplace with, you know, a, as a rank and file worker with the listener in their workplace. Um, and so how do you have conversations? So, you know, you've, you've checked out the landscape. Uh, you've, you've recognized, you know, you, you've looked at how the workplace is organized. You see, you know, you, you recognize the, the titles maybe that people have, training ambassador, but also you recognize the actual, like who is actually having leaders. You can be a learning ambassador or, or this or that or a team lead without having actually people respect you. Um, and that's something that, that I think that people will really take away. One of the things that I remember, and I can't, I can't remember if this was from a, a organizer training with labor notes or with the IWW, but it's always stuck with me. How do you recognize a leader? You pose a question to a rank and file worker and see who they go to to get the answer. And that's going to be, that's a good way to get, to, to see who that worker thinks is a leader. Who do they trust to fix a problem for them? Who do they trust to fix a problem for them? And a lot of times that's not going to be their supervisor. A lot of times that's going to be an experienced coworker. And that is somebody that is very important to have on the campaign. And so how do you begin having these conversations with these people that you have identified as leaders um, to, uh, to, to, to bring them into the campaign? And I guess, I mean, Louise, like since you've been talking a, a, a little while, so, uh, so, so Isaac, yeah. you know, what, what are your, uh, how would you go about answering that? Yeah, there's a couple things um, to kind of draw out here. So I'll just start with what, you know, getting back to kind of assembling your dream team. One of the first exercises we'll do is a scenario, you know, we're, this is a popular education, so we'll be brainstorming together with everyone that's there, but Imagine a scenario where the person you think is the leader, right? They may be the steward, they may be the local president, someone that you think is the, the leader now in your workplace. And what happens if you walk, walk in one day and they're fired, right? They're no longer there. How are you going to get the, the rest of your colleagues together uh, quickly uh, to, to begin a campaign, right? So, you know, if people, if we talk about just sending an email, you know, who are we not reaching just by sending an email, right? So as we begin to identify these leaders, we'll begin to develop these networks of getting information and other people on board so that we can do things quickly, right? So we're thinking of leaders just beyond one person, uh, a centralized leadership into multiple people. And that's, that's to your second point about, you know, forming committees and groups like that. And I'll let Louis speak to that. No, I, I agree with, 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 with that, Isaac. I think that's right on. Um, I, think, um, I, I think a slight disagreement with what like Jacob mentioned is like, it's, yeah, it's like there isn't like one leader, right? That you're gonna identify as gonna solve your problem. I think one of the things that we try to disabuse people of when they come to the labor notes trainings is this idea like we ask people, who does the work? Uh, who does the work in your union, right? Or how many people would you say do the work in your union? Usually, you know, people would say one person, right? And the idea is that we want like a union that's mobilized to take action that has many leaders that is leaderful, <laughs> right? So that's um, so yeah. I, I think sometimes workers also have this mindset of like, if I have a problem, who do I go? Uh, to solve it. And it's like, you're looking at like a service model where it's like, I, I'm going to file away like a complaint and some other person's going to take care of it. Um, so I, I think we, tr we try to, to put out like a different framework about leadership and about how do we solve problems in our union. So I think what Isaac uh, shared was like right on. Yeah. And to your point, Jacob, you know, there are different strategies of ways to identify the natural leaders in your workplace, right? And we'll, we'll go into that some about, you know, you mentioned, you know, who do people go to for, for, for if, if a problem arises. Um, but yeah, so leaders aren't always the loudest in the room. They aren't always the most aggressive or the most courageous. Um, you know, at the very beginning of the call, I mentioned that the, the, the crux of it or the main highlight that we like to take away from when we think about leaders is who are, who do they have followers, right? Leaders have followers. 
And so identifying those people that have followers becomes key in any work that that's going to take place from there. Right, right. And, and the, um, you know, it, I, I definitely agree with what Luis said. And, and the, the illustration that I, I said about uh, who, who do people, this was in the context uh, that that way of identifying, identifying leaders was presented in the context of we are organizing a workplace and how are we going to get an organizing committee? Not necessarily, you know, um, who, who do we go to for problems in a union workplace? And that's going to be the leader. And that's the only person that we talk to. Um, but because that, that it is very important to have, you know, the membership be the membership be in, involved and in, in active um, in when we're addressing issues and stuff. So, you know, how, what are some of, uh, what are some other ways, Isaac, that you, that you think are, um, that, that, that you're going to talk about in this training of identifying leaders? Yeah. So, you know, what, just thinking through scenarios, um, if you attend a, a staff meeting, right, Everybody can probably visualize this as they think through it. When you're attending a staff meeting, there are going to be some of your colleagues that get up and talk. Some colleagues, you're going to cringe and say, oh, they're just talking again. And you're going to begin to tune them out, right? But then there's some leaders that when they get up to speak, people are listening, people are watching, they're agreeing, they're nodding their heads. Um, you know, so... So that's another strategy of thinking about who the leaders are in the workplace. And, you know, and there's other ones, right? Who, uh, if, uh, if someone's having a baby shower, who's the one that gets the information around to come to the baby shower, right? Who, what are the networks that already exist, right? So it goes beyond just putting things in people's mailboxes. It goes beyond just emails and it goes to actually talking to your colleagues. Any other thoughts, Luis? <laughs> and so, you know, if we're we're able to, you know, look look at the way that the workplace is structured and 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 identify leaders, the uh, workshop is titled "Assembling Your Dream Team." What are some other things to think about as you are putting together your workplace committee? Uh, and and Luis, we can throw that to you. Yeah, I mean, I think being flexible, uh, I think uh, Isaac ended on having conversations with people, right? So when we are trying to identify our leaders, we're trying to identify what do people care about? What are they willing to take action on? Because it's a deeply felt concern that they have. So I feel like we have to have the, some flexibility that someone who may have been anti-union can change and become pro-union. So sometimes we try to set like a hard and fast rule on um, like we, we at Labor know sometimes uh, point to our, our bullseye and say, where do people fall in in this bullseye, right? So if you were to po point people, where are your organizers, your supporters, your hostiles, who's in your core committee? Um, I think that's a, those are not set in stone. People move between those concentric circles our task as organizers is to move people closer to the core. So that means that in some campaigns, this doesn't always happen. You could have someone that's in the hostile campaign and they might be hostile, not because they hate the union, but because they hate you as a person. So that means that you're not the right person to move that person, but maybe somebody else is who has a better relationship. Um, so I think when you're assembling your dream team, it's important to not write people off. You want to give people at least three chances, right? You, you it doesn't mean that you're naive that you invite them to the core meeting uh, after they've told you how much they hate unions, but it means that you keep chipping away and talking to them, and you'll never know. Management will do something to them uh, where they will flip. So one concrete example is the woman that I interviewed for a piece I wrote for the Real News about a campaign at, Ref at Refresco, a beverage bottler in New Jersey. Uh, they had to go for an election twice. Um, and during the first election, this woman voted against the union. But the second time, because of some issue with her sick leave, or I mean, her bereavement leave, um, she was she was upset with management and kind of went over and said, you know what, I'm going to mm. screw you by joining the union. 
So, right. so don't underestimate people's pettiness and anger, right? Like they, that can work towards you, right? Towards right. your goals, I should say. For sure, yeah. for sure. And but one of the, me, oh no, go ahead. Yeah, that made me, re, you know, recount a story of, you know, early on when I was organizing and thinking through organizing, I was working with a more um, veteran organizer and interviewing um, workers at a shop that was organizing. And there was this one woman that he approached and she was like, get away from me. I don't want to talk to you, you know, um, leave me alone. And in my mind, as a, as a beginning organizer, I was thinking, well, let's put that person down as hostile. And he goes, no, I'm going to put him down as a maybe. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, we don't know anything about her. We just know she didn't want to talk to us. Right? So it's easy to kind of dismiss people at first glance. But yeah, I, I love that point about give them three tries. And uh, w- one of the things that that I uh, wanted to emphasize I- as far as, um, you know, when you're assembling your dream team, your, your workplace committee um, is the importance of the importance of of diversity and in, in many, you know, in, in as many ways as you can. You know, I think one of uh, a very, very, very important way is if you're in a workplace that has a lot of pretty defined departments, then you're going to want to make sure that you've got people from each of those departments, right? If you're in a restaurant and your committee is only made of front of the house workers, it's only made of of servers and hostesses, that then the back of the house staff is not going to feel very represented by your union and vice versa. Same is true. So it's important to try to find leaders in, you know, in, in each department, um, in each, you know, section of the workplace that you're wanting to represent ideally. And then also, you know, there is, you know, there is the importance of demographic, uh, demographic diversity as well, um, because you want people to feel, you know, you want people to feel represented on the, um, you know, on the committee. When they look at the committee, it would be very easy for, you know, rank and file workers uh, that are not this to look at a, a, a committee of old white men and say, you know, this union doesn't represent me. And so it's important to try to make sure that, that you know, your, your, the, the workplace committee is represented, uh, is representative of the workplace that it's representing. Yeah, and I think a lot of that will come out when you get into the social networks, right? Mm-hmm. Um, if people speak the same language, um, you know, have different backgrounds than, than, there may be a way to connect with them through that. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, you know, uh, Luis, Isaac, I think that we have got a pretty good taste of what people are going to be uh, getting from from this workshop. I appreciate both of y'all's time. Is there anything that either of y'all want to make sure that we hit before uh, before we wrap here? There is one thing I want to highlight. Um, in case no one else you talk to today, any any union, any work group can contact Labor Notes and they'll actually mm-hmm. you know, work with you on developing a training, right? So I had experience of this when I was in San Antonio. Um, we invited some Labor Note trainers out to San Antonio and did a whole workshop with our local union there uh, and went through secrets of a successful organizer. So um, just because you couldn't attend today, it doesn't mean that this resource is no longer available to you. I didn't pay Isaac to say that, but that was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. Yeah, and I, I, I definitely want to second that. That's a, uh, you know, they, I, I've been to one of their trainings before. It was great. Really enjoyed it. Um, and if you are not able to, uh, if you're not able to come on Saturday, on today when you're listening to this. Um, then you can definitely reach out to them, labornotes.org. Luis, anything? Oh, thank you for having me. All right. Luis, Isaac, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. And I'll see you, I'll be seeing you right now. Love it. <laughs> <laughs>
Energy Alabama supports consumers and is a leader in advocating for them. We have been able to successfully fight off utility rate increases in the state, reduce fees for electric vehicles, increase electric vehicle infrastructure spending, and secured a $100 million refund by Alabama Power after the utility overcharged customers for fuel. To learn more about our work advocating for customers and join the fight, go to energyalabama.org. There's a lot of talk about a shortage of workers, but that's not the case with IBW558. We have provided our customers over 3,000 workers and performed over 3 million man hours in a pandemic year. With 8,000 OJT hours, 900 classroom hours, OSHA 30, and a state license, our members receive the equivalent of a master's degree. That's what makes IBW558 the right choice for your electrical needs. Look us up at Facebook or at IBW558.org. North Alabama DSA is looking for folks to work for a better North Alabama. They prioritize mutual aid, municipal activism, and union solidarity. Contact them on social media or DSA North Alabama at Gmail for more information. Support for this program is provided by the International Association for Machinists and Aerospace Workers, Local Lodge 44 in Decatur, Alabama. Learn more at IAMAW44.org. Hometown Action is a grassroots organization building a multiracial working class movement for racial, gender, economic, and environmental justice in Alabama's rural communities. We stand in solidarity with Alabama workers and are proud to support the Valley Labor Report's efforts to inform and build the Southern Worker Movement. Please visit hometownaction.org and follow our social media channels at Hometown Action to learn more about how you too can get involved to make the South a better place for all workers. Solidarity, y'all. Support for this program also comes from the Iron Workers, Local 477. So if you are looking for contractors with lower than average EMR and TRIR, uh, they tell me that if you need to know what those mean, then you will. Uh, or if you need to supplement a workforce at any level for any amount of time, short or long term, if you need iron workers that come trained and certified at no extra cost, or if you need workers from superintendent down to general laborer, and you're looking to start work on a project or you're unhappy with your current contractor situation, you need to call my friend Jeb Miles with the Iron Workers Local 477. They only work with the best in the business, vetted contractors, and can do all kinds of jobs from roofing to steel and bridge erection, from welding to heavy rigging, from structural repairs to machinery alignment, and much more. They supply manpower on four of the five largest projects in North Alabama, so you know they're legit. If you need good quality, safe, efficient, diligent, and knowledgeable workers on your job, then you need the Iron Workers Local 477. Call Jeb Miles at 256-383-3334 or via email at local477 at bellsouth.net and make sure you tell them that you heard about them on the Valley Labor Report. We're the nurses, firefighters, and claims representatives that help keep our government services running. We respond to natural disasters. We care for our nation's veterans. And we investigate discrimination in the workplace. We are federal and D.C. government workers. And we are proud to serve the American people. Working in more than 70 agencies across the government, we know we can fulfill our mission because our union has our back. Learn more at AFGE. Dot O-R-G. Paid for by the American Federation of Government Employees, AFL-CIO. Support for this program also comes from the Mid-South Council of Retail, Wholesale, and Department Store Union. Learn more at rwdsu.info. Come all you poor workers, good news to you, I'll tell how the good old union has come in here to dwell. Alabama's only union talk radio show. This is the Valley Labor Report. My name is Jacob Morrison. My next guest is Courtney Smith. She is a staff organizer for Labor Notes. Courtney, thanks for taking the time to talk to us. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Jacob. I'm really glad to be here. Absolutely. So we are here to talk about your 
uh, workshop that you're going to be facilitating. And this is a workshop that is going to happen twice in the morning and in the afternoon today as people listen to the show. Um, and you're going to be heading up the afternoon session. And the workshop is Beating Apathy. And I think that that is... That's a very important thing. Uh, th- that's a very important thing for people to talk about as we are, um, you know, as we're trying to help people organize their workplace. Because for one reason or another, lots of people feel apathetic, and 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 maybe even maybe even not apathetic as in, oh, it would not be good if things changed, but they're they don't believe things can change and so they have resigned themselves to the reality that they're in and they're and they just accept that as as fact and that it's never going to change and it can't change and if you try to change it you're only in for trouble and and there's nothing good that can come from that and so this is a this is a super super important workshop and and that's why it's one of the ones that I wanted to highlight in the main show today, um, in where we're on the radio, where we're going to have the, the largest audience and, and the, the most diverse audience. You know, when we're on uh, the second half of the show, we're online only. So we're going to be getting a lot more union members, a lot more stewards, you know, people that are more sympathetic. They've heard some of this before. Um, when we're on the radio, we have, you know, we've got lots of people listening to us that, that listen to us sometimes, all the time, maybe for the first time right now. That maybe that that have had the thought, I'd like for things to be better, but but there's no way that I can do that. There's no way that it can change, and and I can never form a union. And so you know that's that's why I wanted to highlight this workshop. I think it's really important. Absolutely, yeah. So the workshop really, um, we kind of start off grounding people in how they're how they solve problems in the workplace or in their union at currently. Um, and get them to start thinking about uh, the limitations and the challenges of that um, actually building power. And then we kind of go into, um, you know, giving examples of of people who currently, how they currently solve problems and talk through that. We have a lot of discussion. Um, We treat these workshops as, you know, everybody that's participating is a teacher and a learner. So nobody in the room is an expert. We're all here to learn from each other. Um, and, um, you know, talk about our experiences. So we, we have a lot of group discussion. Uh, we then go into talking about how the boss keeps us disorganized. And that's, you know, fear, hopelessness, uh, confusion, and division. Um, and we talk about uh, strategies to overcome those barriers. Um, and then once we kind of dig in on that and we discuss like how that manifests in the workplace, we then go into talking about uh, having how to have one-on-one conversations with people. And I think the crux of, of that is, is not that we're trying to give people a, a script um, for, them to, for them to manually follow. We're really giving them a roadmap and um, giving them some kind of pr- some principles to go by um, because organizing conversations aren't just gripe sessions for you to complain about what's going on at work and then do nothing about it, right? There's there's supposed to be a goal there to get people, to motivate people into action. And so like you said, Jacob, you know, um, a lot of people feel apathetic. And so we try to drill in the point that apathy isn't real, that everybody cares about something at work. And the only way we're going to figure that out is if we have these one-on-one conversations with them and we really try to get to know them as human beings and also as a part of a collective and for them to see themselves in the in a way that capitalism will never allow them to see themselves as a part of something bigger than them, as a part of a collective um, that actually has power. And so the organizing conversation really uh, drills that in and um, we get people to practice, you know, how to ask good questions, how to be Mm -hmm. an active listener, um, things like that, Um, and how to, you know, create a sense of urgency and a sense of hope. Like you said, um, I, you know, a lot of people don't believe that things can change. And so how can we um, instill that in them? How can we inspire them to believe that uh, they have the power to solve their own problems? I um, mean, that it's not outside of themselves and it's it's not, you know, um, out of the realm of possibility. And we do that through, you know, uh, through those 
conversations through those discussion, uh, group discussions that we have with other workers who've done the organizing, who have overcome these obstacles and have you know, came, uh, came upon the boss and actually won, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and we are able to share those um, with people and then, you know, inspire them to hopefully take action in their own work. Yeah, and I, so I think that's a great overview, and and we'll we'll go back to the top and drill in a little bit about into how the boss keeps us fearful and divided and and apathetic. And so, what are what are some of the ways that that bosses maybe intentionally, maybe unintentionally, because this is just the way that our workplaces are structured, it, you know, in capitalism? How does the boss keep us apathetic or fearful? Yeah, I mean, so there's a lot of tactics that bosses use. Um, So fear being a tactic, right? So everybody's really afraid that, you know, they'll be fired, uh, they'll be laid off um, if they uh, take action on an issue. Um, And that's, you know, obviously we we know that that's a real barrier that people have. Um, And so, you know, we we encourage them um, by you know, sharing that there is strength in numbers, that they're, mm. um, if, if all of you come together, then they're, they can't fire all of you. Right. So, um, there's many other tactics for fear. Um, there's confusion. There's the, you know, putting out information that is in fact, fact based. We all know about, you know, union busters, um, just telling blatant lies about what is happening um, and not giving people the correct information that they need. Um, And then, and so, you know, um, we overcome that, the strategy to overcome that is by, you know, transparency and being honest and communicating to, uh, to workers, like what is actually going on. Um, Then we have, uh, so we have fear, hopelessness, which we, we kind of touched on that, you know, that feeling of um, there's nothing that can be done about it. And that, you know, I think that tactic is what we see in capitalism all the time. We see that in democracy that like, oh, can't do anything about it. Um, right. And then division being the most important one. Um, so the boss has a lot of tactics to um, that ways that it manifests in the workplace. Uh, one of them being racism, um, sexism, um, homophobia, all of these different isms. Uh, um, that keep people divided, but also like literal literal divisions where you have, you know, in restaurant workers, for example, have front and back of house workers, um, or you have the two tier workers uh, who are divided by mm. by their wage, things like that. Um, and we try to, you know, overcome that that barrier by um, instilling people that we're all in the same boat, right? Like capitalism is exploiting everyone. Um, the, the bosses are enemy and not each other um, and really drilling that in to overcome that barrier. But, but that's probably the hardest one. Right. Right. Well, and the um, you know, and, and, and you mentioned that as far as trying to deal with the hopelessness that, that nothing um, or, or, and the apathy um, you know, the idea that, that somebody wouldn't want something to change or, or that, that everybody cares about something. And, and that's just a fact. Even if somebody says, you know, they've got a good job or they, you know, they like this or they like that aspect, maybe they even have a good relationship with their supervisor. I have a fine relationship with my supervisor, right? Um, and, and yet I'm still a union activist. And so one of the questions that, uh, that I believe that I heard at one of the labor notes trainings that I've that I've been to before is, is the magic wand question, right? You know, if you're talking mm-hmm. to somebody and you ask them, you know, okay, I give you a magic wand, what are three things that you would change in your workplace tomorrow? And very, very few people uh, have nothing. <laughs> you know, there's yeah. there's very few few people that, given the power of a magic wand, there's not a couple of things that they would change. And and so then you know you can begin the conversation of like okay well how how do we actually change and that goes to what you were talking about um, when when you talked about combating the fear that people have is that there's power in numbers not only is it more difficult for them to retaliate against you which is something that people are fearful of but uh, it's also more difficult th- for them to resist 
uh, the demands that you're making when you have more people, which is, uh, you know, a reason for apathy. And, and so, you know, these are all things that, that, that you're going to be talking about in, in, in the workshop that's, you know, important for people to understand. And, and the through line is that there's power in numbers. And that's, you know, that's why, you know, that's why it's called a union. You know, we're, we're united, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I'll, you know, I'll do you a question even better. There was uh, someone came up with a question on the last workshop that I did um, last month. And their question was, is this your dream job? Mm. And I just was like mind blown because, you know, it really gets people to start I because I think it's easy for people to answer the, the magic wand question of being like, oh, I don't know. I mean, things seem fine. The, you know, it's kind of the best that I can get within the current conditions. Mm. Um, but the dream job question, I think, gets them to really see, like, you know, get to thinking about. No, actually, I w if I were to have my my pick of a job it would be with these sorts of like right. conditions um that is completely different from what we have now uh so i thought you know um that was just an amazing question to kind of get people to start thinking about how they would change their workplace uh but yeah you're right jacob i think one of the things that i i forgot to mention um that we also talk about in this workshop is the bullseye which um, for anybody who has the secrets handbook, we have the bullseye is on the front cover. And um, that talks about, you know, thinking about your union um, and your workplace as a bullseye. And so in the in the center, you have your core group of people. And then on the out outside of that is maybe your supporters, and then you have the disengaged and you have the hostile. And it's it's uh, you know, not a static thing. It, mm. it's it's dynamic right it it can change and and be fluid and so we we start getting people to think about how can you bring in someone who is disengaged into being a supporter how can you bring a supporter into being your core group um so that way you know it goes from just a few of us doing the work to the majority of us doing work and uh really building power in the workplace that way Right. And and a big way that we bring people one layer closer to the bullseye um, is one on one conversations. And so we'll we'll talk shortly uh, in, in, in a bit about how we have those one on one conversations. But, you know, uh, first, I think it's important to to um, ask the question, what is so important about one on one conversations? Why can't I just send them an email? Why can't I have a, a mass meeting and, and just get it all over with at once, right? I, I, I'm a busy person. I'm a busy person, Courtney. I don't have time for one-on-one -on -one meetings. Why do I have to have one-on-one -on -one meetings? Why can't I just call everybody that I want to talk to? All these people, I work with 400 people. Why can't I just call them all in and talk to them at once? These are great questions, Jacob. Um, and that those are the exact questions that I pose to the group when we're having this workshop is like, do we think having talked about all of the barriers that we face in the workplace of fear, division, hopelessness and confusion that an email or a nicely graphed, gra you know, flyer will um, will be enough for people to overcome their fears and you know the obvious answer there is no it's not mm -hmm. otherwise they would have already been involved right if that was working um and so the one on one conversations um like i said i i think the importance of the one on one conversations is really um allowing people to know themselves in a way that capitalism doesn't and i i just i i love that framing of it because you know i think um we're not treated as human beings in the ex especially in the workplace but even out in the real world you know um when your uh basic human needs are commodified and every little thing that uh you you have to pay for it, for everything in mm. in capitalism right all of you, all of your basic needs are are can be taken from you like that and um, I think it really, you know, it it alienates people, makes people feel alone and um, confused and afraid and just all of these things. And so having the one-on-one -on -one conversations really starts the process in, um, in, trans in the transformation for people to believe that uh, the problems that they're experiencing um, 
are not theirs alone, right? That I think capitalism also has a lot of ideology that that makes people believe that, you know, I'm just not working hard enough. Mm-hmm. I'm not doing X, Y, and Z. Um, and so when we're able to um, have conversations and kind of lay the blame correctly on the boss and, and the boss doesn't have to be your direct supervisor, right? Your boss it can be the the, the person above them or the um, lawmakers, uh, elites, right? Like the boss is uh, an abstract term that we use to describe the people who are in power. Um, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought there. Yeah, I mean, the boss makes us believe that w- we're the reasons for our for our issues, right? And so the organizing conversation lays the blame correctly on the boss, and it and it allows people to see that their so their problems have solutions, mm. um, and that they actually have the power to come together with other people to solve their problems. Um, and I think um, you can't do that in an email or a flyer. Right. You can't, or you or can't even a meeting, that. you know, it's hard to have, you know, yeah. because the importance of, it, it, it's just difficult to change to to change people's minds or to change their understanding of their situation in the workplace and in the world, even in a meeting, even though it's face to face, you've got all these other people, it's impersonal. You know, the uh, you know, I think you spoke really well to the importance of of, of having a one on one conversation with people. And how humanizing that can be, how humanizing that can be, because we don't often take what, uh, you know, we, we do not often take that time to to understand one another um, and to talk to one another um, and to understand how we can work together to make our lives better and the lives of our coworkers and our community better. Um, and, and so that's, I you know, I think that the one on one conversation is, is very important. And so that leads into like, OK, you know. Courtney, fine. You've convinced me. I'm not going to just send an email. I'm going to go get coffee with somebody. Okay. How do, how do I do that? How do I, well, I guess, you know, I I said, I'm going to go have coffee with somebody, but, but how do I ask someone to go have a one-on-one with me? That's pretty awkward. uh, You know, especially in today's day and age, right? We like to text, we like to uh, email, we, we, you know, we like to do things not in person. And, And so, you know, asking somebody, Asking somebody out may be, uh, you know, may feel pretty awkward to somebody. So how do I, if I'm convinced that it's important, how do I first make the ask to somebody to, you know, talk to me about, uh, uh, you know, about work and about uh, making our work better? And then how do I have that conversation once I've gotten their commitment? Mm-hmm. Yeah, these are really big questions that um, I think I've been mulling over. I've been an organizer for four years now. um, And I think the way that I've been trained as an organizer kind of reproduces the way capitalism makes us feel. Um, So I've been really rethinking like how we have these organizing conversations. um, And I think we put a little too much like um, maybe urgency or, you know, this uh, like we have to produce the results immediately, mm. right? Like, um, I think what's important to instill here or to keep in mind here is that these are conversations that will happen over time. And so it's, you know, it could start off with, you know, organizing a, a social happy hour for people to go out and, you know, just like have some fun and let loose after work, right? And kind of getting getting to know people that way. Um, and, and then from there, you know, creating those, um, those one-on-one relationships with people, um, to get to the point of having, you know, making an ask, right. Um, I don't think that the organizing conversation that even the the steps of an organizing conversation happens all in one setting, I think it can happen over time. And, um, you know, so I think organizers in particular, like, you know, can take the pressure off of themselves and realize like, you know, you're in this for a long call, you don't have to like get a result right away. You know, there are ways that you can um, try to work up to getting to know people one on one in order to have these conversations. 
Um, and then once you do, um, you know, some of the, the guiding principles that we have is uh, we use an acronym and it's called a HUI. Um, and so that's A-H-U-Y. Uh, so the A stands for ask, agitate, and anger. And that just means like at this point, we're asking questions, we're identifying what their issues are and tapping into their righteous anger. Um, the H stands for hope. And so we're sharing our plan to win or examples of success. Um, and kind of at this stage here, like, um, like I said, we're, we're giving people a roadmap. So we're not, we're not trying to sell somebody something. We're not trying to convince them to buy something from us. Um, the hope can, can really just be like, read this labor notes article of this, you know, of a fight that happened, you know, with this exact same issue that you shared and learn about how other workers have actually done this. Um, or it could be, you know, something as simple as, wow, Stacy just told me that she was also experiencing that same issue. I wonder if, you know, are you able to, you know, get together with other people to talk about this? Um, you know, and just getting people to, to get outside of themselves, that it's just their problem alone. Um, so that's the H, that hope. Um, and then urgency. Um, I struggle with this one a little bit. So um, that's, this is the part where I feel like, you know, kind of reproduces capitalism um, to say now is the time to act. I think if we, if if we say that every time we talk to somebody, they're going to stop mm. believing us, right? right. Um, but how, like I said, organizing conversations aren't just gripe sessions. So I do still think that there's, you know, an importance there to instilling in somebody like that we can do something and we should try to act on it, um, you know, while the while the iron is hot, right? Um or while we're, while we're building up to that, like, let's do something about this now because it's not okay. It's not mm. okay for us to be dealing with these, you know, terrible conditions. Um, and then the last one is the why, and that's you. Um, and it's simply, can we count on you to come to a meeting and talk about this with other coworkers? You know, whatever it is that, uh, whatever that plan to win is, um, you're, you know, that's the ask that you're making. Mm. You're trying to get them to commit to coming, um, to uh, committing to your plan to win, to your collective plan to win. I should say that. <laughs> right, right. And I, and I think that, you, you know, you mentioned this at the beginning, but it's important to understand, I think, that not every single one of these things that you mentioned is going to happen in um, in one one-on-one -on -one conversation. Maybe you only get through one. Maybe you only uh, only get through like understanding, uh, you know, wh what some of what some of their problems are. And uh, your the acronym that Labor Notes has tracks pretty closely with the IAWWs, uh, A E I O U. I don't know if you've uh, heard uh, their acronym for their one-on-one -on -one conversations, but it's A E I O U, and they and it stands for agitate, which sounds very close to what y'all what y'all's is then educate which is very close to the hope um you know it's educating mm -hmm. them about similar situations where people have won uh agitate educate inoculate tell them about mm -hmm. what the boss is gonna uh you know what they can expect you know let, let them understand that there are risks but they you can inoculate those risks you can protect yourself against the risks of facing the boss and that is by you know generally by coming together right uh, o, organize, try to get them, uh, to try to actually get them on the committee in the union, uh, you know, uh, sign a red card, some, uh, sign an authorization card, something like that. And then uh, U is, is push for the union, uh, which is make an ask. And so, you know, they always mention and you mentioned and in all the trainings that I've always been in before, it's important to understand that you're not going to get to every single one of these likely in each conversation um, because as you mentioned when you began that, you know, we are not treated like humans a lot uh, uh, under capitalism, at our jobs, in, you know, in society, as everything is commodi commodified, we're treated, treated like another number. And so 
it is imperative upon us as as workers trying to organize other workers to not reproduce that when we're talking mm-hmm. to people. And so we don't want to treat, you know, w- we really, really, really have to fight the, um, you know, the the default that we can have to just treat these conversations like another number like okay i have to hit i have to hit number five the fifth column on my spreadsheet today and that happens to be you know joe blow right and so i have to talk to him and i have to get through a e i o and u i have to do all of these things that's not how conversations work that's not how people work we we want to take yeah the, it's take not our organic time. right yeah right. it's not genuine like i um yeah, I, I know I really struggled with this as an organizer in, um, you know, a, a previous job that I've had where I would, you know, kind of asked, like, can we just not make the ask and like, just genuinely get to know these people? <laughs> and they would like flip their shit. It was like, what do you mean not make the ask? And then I came to labor notes and they were like, don't worry about the ask. And it was so mm-hmm. relieving. I was like, oh, my, I can actually like focus on building a relationship you know, rather than just making this transactional, because people can feel that, right? Like you can Mm. feel when there's going to be, you know, something that this person wants from you out of this conversation. Um, So I think it is important for us to really focus on like on on building genuine relationships with people. Um, We have we have another workshop that we do um, that really kind of hones in on like, how do we build community with each other in the workplace? And food is another way to do that. Mm. Um, you know, so um, yeah, I think just impressing on people like this is about building relationships and seeing ourselves in a way that that um, the workplace doesn't want us to see ourselves. So, um, you know, treating someone as just you know, I got to get to the ask. I got to get through all of these steps. It's just, it's mechanical. It's not, it's not really organic. So um, yeah, we really try to focus more on, you know, what are the types of questions that you can ask? Like, you know, and kind of categorizing questions in, you know, what are the introduction questions that you could ask? What are the agitational questions that you could ask? What are some polarizing questions um, and some commitment questions, right? Um so really just, you know, um, I think reconditioning people to uh, be good listeners and to be curious mm. about someone else, I think, is is kind of the crux of, of how we frame our organizing conversation. Courtney Smith, uh, staff organizer with Labor Notes, we really appreciate your time. Is there anything else that you wanted to make sure that uh, that we hit before we wrap here? No, I think we covered like the whole thing. <laughs> um, I'm really excited to do the workshop and to to do the, the, the troublemaker school. Can't wait to meet all of you. Um, so feel free to stop by and say hi. All right, folks. Uh, appreciate it, Courtney. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Jacob. And folks, that is going to be it for our main show today. But you can find us online. We're on Facebook and YouTube streaming live right now. So go find us there at the Valley Labor Report, and you can continue listening to us where we are going to be talking to Matthew Fallone from Local 3905, 3905 of the Communication Workers of America about a couple of stewards workshops that he is going to be giving for the Labor Notes Troublemaker School down in Montevallo. And then we will be talking to Isaiah Thomas about race and labor. Uh, So we got a really good overtime lined up for you today. Um, I hate that you were not able to make the Troublemaker School, presumably if you're listening to this, Um, but maybe you'll be able to make the next one. And I hope that uh, this program is of some consolation. With that, folks, we are going to go right into overtime. And for our radio listeners, we appreciate your time. We'll see you next week. And all power to the workers. All right, folks, we are off the radio now. And we are going to head to a break really quick. And we will be right back with Matthew Fallone.
Alrighty, folks, we are now in overtime, and we've got Matthew Fallone, a member of CWA Local 3905, representing AT&T workers here in Huntsville. Matt, appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. My pleasure, Jacob. Glad you had me. Absolutely. And and, and you, you are a steward at, at that local, right, presumably? I am, yep. Uh, so I'm a steward, and I'm also the organizer of our local. Correct. Okay, great, great. So you are going to be with co-host Adam Keller facilitating two workshops today. At, today, as people are listening, um, but a couple days as we're recording. Um, two workshops, the first being the legal rights of union stewards, and then the second being using grievances to build power. And so we will go with uh, the first one first, which is the legal rights of union stewards. And just uh, we'll start off with an overview of what people uh, can expect if they were able to attend this. You know, maybe some people are listening to this later, um, but for the people but also for the people who who aren't able to attend and and are listening live. uh, What would you expect from this workshop, the legal rights of union stewards? So basically, when it comes to union stewards, we are given special status by law due to the NLRA, uh, which basically says, as a steward, we are in any sort of a capacity when it comes to meeting with management, the employer, the bosses, um, we are they're equal. So even though you may just be a regular old worker, if you walk into a meeting with management um, for any reason, whether it's to represent somebody, whether it's contract negotiations, bargaining, stuff like that, um, you are at the same level. So I could walk in, you know, I work, you said AT&T, I work for DirecTV. I work in a call center. I can walk into a meeting with the site director, the top guy in that building, and he and I are equal at that meeting. Um, so those are the law, uh, the you know the legal um, rights that stewards are given um, due to the NLRA. And so, what does that? And I guess we should even um, you know maybe it would even be good to to go back and uh, just a little bit and ask how how what is a steward even? So a steward is a representative. Um, of the local or the union. Um, so what we do is, um, you know, we're kind of, I wouldn't say the middleman, but we are the representatives of all the, the members of the union. So if it comes to, you know, disciplinary meetings, any sort of an issue that arises within the workplace, uh, it is our job to, uh, you know, take those concerns, those issues, those complaints, and bring them to management and make sure um, that you know management is hearing our voices and making sure uh, that things are being accomplished uh, so that every single employee isn't having to run into the manager's office. So what a steward will do, um, you know, we work on grievances, we represent agents when they're in disciplinary meetings. Um, one of the most important parts of a steward, in my opinion, uh, as I'm an organizer as well, um, and we'll go over that a little bit later, um, is also making sure that the workplace is organized so that we are hearing the complaints, making sure that we understand what's happening. Um, in my opinion, that's probably the most important part of what we do. Right, right. And so, you know, going back to the legal rights, you said, you know, you, you have these abilities to have meetings, whether they're grievance procedures or a disciplinary meeting or, you know, contract negotiations, all of these things, you know, you've got got a kind of special status that places you more on par with, uh, with the employer in those meetings. Um, and one of the important uh, legal rights that union stewards have is, and, and that members have the ability to call on their union stewards, is, is wine garden rights. Can you talk to us about what those are? So what the wine garden rights are, um, they're federally guaranteed rights, um, and you know, in in our local, and I'm sure it's the same in many other locals. What we do, you know, when we uh, initiate new membership, um, you know, we have the posted on the wall wherever you go. Um, what they guarantee is that if any uh, meeting between um, 
a worker, a member, uh, any sort of meeting with management, if that manager or that meeting can lead to any sort of discipline, um, they are guaranteed representation by a steward or a member of the union or, you know, a steward mostly. Um, so what we tell our new members and old members, members that have been around forever in case they've forgotten, um, is that any time you're called into a meeting with management, the first question you always ask without hesitation is, can this meeting lead to discipline? And if the answer to that question is yes, you have the right right then and there to stop that meeting and request representation from a union uh, representative, steward. Um, those are very important because obviously um, uh, employers, big corporations, you know, may try to pull fast ones, uh, use uh, scare tactics, stuff like that. So we're there to make sure that everybody uh, is treated equally, fairly, uh, and there's no funny business happening mm -hmm. uh, by the bosses. Right, right. And so what are some other, uh, you know, are there any other rights that you're going to be talking about in this workshop? So, I mean, basically we're going to be covering those rights when it comes to stewards, not necessarily members, uh, but stewards. Um, so when it comes to those rights, so, you know, like we said, going into a meeting, we're equal. Um, so what that rule also covers, or that law also covers is behaviors that you may not normally be able to get away with when it comes to your worker boss relationship. Mm -hmm. um, so not only are we equals, but we can treat them as such. So if let's say, you know, the, the main guy running the meeting, the main boss, the site director, a manager, whatever the case may be, um, you know, if I feel like they're being condescending or if they're not telling the truth, it's within my right to call them a liar. It's within my right to call them a jackass. It's within my right to do a lot of things um, that normally would lead to discipline, possibly firing. Um, so stuff like that. So that's what that, that special status covers. Um, also, when it comes to, you know, in particular, when we're talking about like grievance procedure, um, you know, the right to request information is also a very important uh, mm. legal right for stewards. Um, so, you know, when you're defending somebody in a matter of discipline, um, you know, that's not necessarily for me, you know, with this as a steward, but when it comes to like people who are bargaining with the company come contract time, um, they are also able to request information. Um, so the company has to abide by those rules. So they have to release information to us that is requested as long as it is, you know, has, has something to do with the issue that we're, we're talking about. I can't just, mm -hmm. you know, we can't just ask some crazy stuff. Um, but what we'll do is make sure with that information, like I said, the, I mean, the main important thing that we make sure when it comes to our members is that everybody's tre being treated equally and fairly. So when we request information, we can request information from not, th not only that person, but we can request information from everybody in the past, you know, few years that have been disciplined for the same thing or about to be disciplined for the same thing. We can also request information um, about people who are not bargained employees. Mm -hmm. So if there's an issue with say a manage, uh, specific manager, we're able to re request information on them. And then also make sure that when it comes to discipline for managers, they're not being treated any differently than a bargained employee would be. Um, so that in my opinion is also one of the more important things because they have no way to hide that information from us. They have to provide any and all information that we request. Like I said, as long as it's, you know, it has to do with the subject, but that is a, a huge issue, especially when it comes to grievances, whether or not somebody has been fired or about to be fired or levels uh, added to another step of discipline. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's a very important thing. Yeah. And so the, the right to request information, is that enforced through the NLRB? Like if they don't, uh, you know, if, if I sit as a steward, I send an information request and then they don't, they just ignore it. Is that, is that something that you file a ULP over and that potentially the NLRB could, you know, compel them to, to grant? Absolutely. 100%. So they have to follow those rules and regulations as well. Um, like I said, I mean, you can't just ask crazy stuff. Um, mm -hmm. 
you know, you can't, uh, you know, be threatening, you know, it has to be something that's pertaining to the issue at hand, but yes, they have to provide that information. Any other important, uh, rights that, that you think, uh, that, that you're going to be going over during this training? You know what? I think that's about it. I mean, those are the most important Mm -hmm. things. I mean, what we're going to do probably, you know, and we'll probably do the same thing for the other, the other panel as well. Um, but we're also, you know, obviously that room is probably going to be full of stewards. And mm-hmm. one of the most important things, I think, especially, you know, you, you and I were both at Labor Notes, the big conference. Um, one of the great things about that conference is bringing a lot of people together um, from different unions. Um, one thing that I learned while I was there is, you know, being a member of the CWA, which is a huge union that's been around for quite a while. There have been rights and you know, stuff that we've won throughout the years, well before I became a member. But there are also smaller unions across the country that are fighting for those very same rights as we speak. So it's good to see and hear from other unions. Uh, so that's why we want to you know, kind of turn it over to everybody in the room, um, because we're all at the same level, right? Um, just to see how everybody else is doing and hopefully learn you know, a different way of going about things just by hearing what other people do in certain situations that you may not have thought of, um, stuff that we can do in the future, uh, you know, in a certain situation, like a grievance, uh, you know, that you're beating your head up against the wall uh, with a specific manager, maybe somebody else has a different suggestion. Um, So that's one of the good things that we're hoping to accomplish while we're at that panel. Yeah. And so the, uh, you know, this is a, it's a training about the legal rights of union stewards, but Labor Notes is not generally known for its, you know, um, for its emphasis on on legalistic measures, right? Uh, and so there's obvi- there there's there's some different undertones uh, to there's going to be some different undertones to this training as opposed to just you know this is the law and you need to know the law and the law will protect you and 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 all that. Uh, you know, it, there there are, are reasons that it's important to understand what your rights are as a union steward so that you can better represent your uh, fellow workers and so that you can better organize your fellow workers. What are some of the what are some of the reasons to to understand your rights, um, you know, given by the law? And then and then also, you know, other p- potentially ancillary rights in your contract that are beyond the law. What are you know, why, how, why should a steward know those and know those kind of like the back of their hand? Um, and, and how will knowing those <clears throat> help them to better organize their, their fellow workers? So, yeah, so that's the most important part. You know, we, um, we keep that in mind. Uh, we, in our local, when it comes to stewards, our vice president always states he is, he knows the, our contract like the back of his hand. So the contract is the most important thing um, because contracts vary, you know, what one union deals with, you know, maybe another one doesn't. Um, but knowing the contract, knowing the rules can only mean that you're going to represent your, um, your, you know, your member better. Um, mm-hmm. You know, not to say that all companies do it on purpose, um, but I'm sure a lot of them do whether or not the management knows the rules, the regulations, the contract, um, or whether or not they are, you know, trying to play games um, to see what they can get away with. We were in a meeting, um, our leadership was in a meeting with our management the other day um, and just the games that he tried to play. Um, But um, knowing your contract, knowing the rules, knowing the regulations is going to make sure that none of that happens. And you can make sure uh, that if you continually demonstrate that you know that rule, that regulation, that law, the company that you work for, the union, or the you know, what your union, who your union is dealing with, they're not going to try to play those those games any longer because they know they're going to be caught. So, like I said, not to say that they're doing it, whether it's intentional or not, or not intentional. Um, most companies <laughs> historically are going to try to play those games to see right. what they can get away with. Right, right, and how how does knowing these how does how does knowing these rights and and being able to enforce them how does that help you um, 
organize your members? Well, the, the membership is going to be happy when you can, uh, you know, present them with victories mm. <laughs> you know, in situations. Uh, so, you know, if you're continually, you know, losing employees or people are being disciplined um, for things and, you know, you're going into grievances and you're never winning, um, you know, they're going to lose faith. Um, but if you go into a meeting and you're continually uh, producing results, um, it makes it a lot easier uh, to get everybody excited about what you can do. You know, it, it's ironic. The other, the, probably a couple of weeks ago, uh, we had an issue with Direct TV at our call center, uh, where contractually we are paid every two weeks. It's how it always is. It's how it always will be. And that's our contract. Um, in the call center, we have what we call an incentive. So it's a monthly incentive. It's basically a bonus. It's dependent upon your 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 results, right? Um, so not every, not necessarily every other week, but the week we that week we were supposed to get our bonus check. So there was supposed to be our regular forty hour check, and then our bonus. So the bonuses can range anywhere between five hundred to a thousand dollars, depending. You know, it could be less, could be a little bit more. Uh, so it's a significant chunk of money, right? Um, and this bonus check fell on the 29th of the month. So it was a Friday, it was the 29th, you know, what comes up on the first rent, you know, bills. So people are dependent upon that money. We already know what we're supposed to get. Um, so people know what their check is supposed to be like. Um, so a lot of people have direct deposit, depending on what type of bank you have, you may have, you may get that direct deposit notification on a Wednesday. So on a Wednesday, people were starting to, you know, to hit us up. Uh, whether it be my phone or Facebook page that we use. Uh, but a lot of people were starting to say, hey, you know, this isn't looking right. Um, mm. So, you know, a couple of the guys within the union, myself and a few others, you know, we started to look into it, discover what the issue was. And what we found out was that the bonus was not included in that check. So like I said, five hundred mm. thousand dollars could it be, you know. Um, so obviously that's not going to make anybody happy. So what we immediately did, we heard the complaints of the membership immediately started um, making phone calls, making emails. Um, but what we also did is made sure that each individual agent was either sending emails to their direct supervisor and then CCing that with their supervisor um, so that the company was aware that we were aware that there was something wrong. Mm. Um, and that pressure that, that we organized uh, within our membership got the results that we wanted. So within probably a couple hours, and this has happened in the past with certain things, and it's always, and I'm sure it's the same thing with a lot of other companies, um, you know, well, we'll get you on the next check, you know, we'll, mm. we'll, we'll make it up to you. So we weren't going to allow that to happen. Um, you know, we, we made them aware that we were not going to allow that to happen. Um, so within a few hours, we got um, an email from the higher, higher ups um, stating that they were aware of the issue. Um, and that there was going to be a second off cycle check cut. We were going to get it on the same day. So the pressure um, that we were able to organize within our membership, we believe is what forced their hand to make sure that that money came uh, at the proper time. Um, and in my opinion, although it was a bad thing, because it was a stressful situation for a lot of people um, because they weren't, didn't know what was going to happen. Uh, but we, as a union, used that uh, power, that pressure, to organize and make sure people were aware of the power of our union. And they, we were able to demonstrate that um, and it made everybody happy. Um, right. So that, that instance, I'm sure, um, you know, we got, you know, a hundred uh, requests to join the Facebook page, uh, mm -hmm. you know, people patting us on the back. So, you know, it, in the call center, we work at it's work from home. Um, so organizing is tough now. Uh, so we use the Facebook page as one of our main things and for a significant amount of people to request to join that Facebook page makes us a much stronger union. Absolutely. I, I think so. And and I think that this uh, this kind of bleeds into the next workshop, which is, you know, the uh, the the using grievances to build to build power. And I think that this is something that that, you know, potentially. Maybe, you know, one individual person, you individually as a steward could have just filed a grievance and then maybe you do or you don't get a win at some point and, and maybe you do or, you know, but that's not very, that doesn't build power very much. But you were able to include in this action, 
you and your and, and the you know the executive board, the other stewards, the vice president, all these people, you were able to include um, everybody, all of your coworkers in this action, and you were able to build their faith and trust in one another, uh, and therefore their union, and and so you were you were able to use a grievance, a, a grievance in the you know, in, in, in the layman's use of the words, there was, you know, you, you had a grievance with the situation, not in the technical, you know, right. sense maybe, uh, but, and, and you were able to use that to build power. And so, you know, the second workshop that you're going to be facilitating with Adam Keller is, uh, is, is titled Using Grievances to Build Power. And so first, uh, let's just get an understanding of, of grievance. You know, I said that using grievance in the in a layman's term but but there's also a contractual um, meaning of that word what does grievance mean when union people talk about it so agreements to us would mean there is some sort of a discipline that took place some sort of an issue that took place um, so you know I'll use an example uh, you know with the CWA uh, there's a, a, a step of discipline so if you are you know you do something wrong they're going to follow that step so you know there's there's coaching, then there's um, written warning, then final warning, then you know termination stuff like that. So they kind of have to follow that structure um, when it comes to discipline. Um, so let's say um, you know you did something wrong, um, the company investigates it, they come back and say, you know what, uh, Matt, uh, we're going to put you on a written warning for what you did. Um, so that written warning usually will require some sort of, um, you know, something was done wrong and the prior steps should have been used. So, you know, you, they can't just walk in and fire me because I did something wrong one day. Um, you know, they're going to have to give me some sort of coaching. They're going to have to write it down. We're going to have to make sure that there's a process that goes with it. Um, so if, if, you know, they skip those steps of discipline and the, the, um, the discipline doesn't fit the, the crime, um, what we can do is file a grievance. Um, we can, which of course is protected by the contract, um, the NLRB. Um, so what we do is the, you know, the person who doesn't agree with the, the discipline will file what we call a statement of occurrence. They'll explain the situation, um, you know, what they feel is wrong. Um, and then we will go to um, the company um, and say, hey, you know, we believe this wasn't done properly. So our main concern at all times within our membership is that everybody is treated, treated equally and fairly. Um, so if we see that one person is being uh, singled out, um, that's wrong, can't be done. Uh, but if let's say somebody did the same thing that that person did and was given a different punishment, then we want to make sure that both people are getting the same punishment. Um, so we'll file that grievance with the company. They will do some investigation. We will do some investigation. Um, you know, one step we will use in that is the request for information, which we talked about earlier. Um, so we want to make sure um, through that information that we request that all of those things are met. So, um, you know, that somebody else wasn't given a different punishment for the same, pri same crime, um, you know, stuff like that. So um, usually once that request for information is filed, we can then uh, investigate what they saw you know, and see what information they use to come up with some sort of a punishment or discipline. Um, and then what we'll ultimately do is um, have a formal meeting with management again, uh, where basically it's not necessarily a, ne a negotiation, but we want to present our points um, to give our side of the story. Um, some departments, not necessarily the one that we work at, will use like an arbitrator. They'll, they'll even go up a little bit higher. But usually within our call center, it's just a matter of, uh, you know, coming to some sort of a negotiation with management where what will make, we'll, you know, fair treatment is the concern. So if we can demonstrate that they did something wrong, uh, that somebody else was given a, a lesser punishment for the same same issue, um, what we'll do is then, you know, like I said, negotiate that process and hopefully either reduce or remove uh, that discipline. Um, a lot of times in our, you know, in our line of work, there's a lot of attendance issues um, so sometimes there's, uh, you know, there's a point system that will, once you reach a certain level of points, you're, you're going to get terminated. Um, uh, but, um, you know, if we can demonstrate that some of those points were incorrect, uh, they shouldn't have been there, or there was an agreement they had with their, their manager or something, um, we can get points removed. 
um, and reduce that punishment. And in some cases, we've gotten people their jobs back. Um, you know, hopefully in the case of people that have lost their jobs for a significant part of time, we'll also make them whole, which means they get their job back. And then also any kind of back pay that they missed during that time frame. Um, but the grievance process is a very important process because it's, it's what we use to keep the company honest when it comes to discipline and making sure that everybody's treated fairly. Right, right. And so when you when when we're thinking about how can we use this grievance process to build power, um, you know, there there's definitely a sensitive thing because a lot of the times grievances deal with potential disciplinary issues. And 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 I don't think all the time. I think my understanding of, of what a grievance is is that you know you're you're basically charging that the company is in violation of the contract in, in, in one form yep. or another. Um, and it doesn't have right. to be disciplinary, but a lot of times it is. Um, and, yep. and so maybe, you know, somebody is, you know, when you're think when you're talking about disciplinary issues, it, people oftentimes don't want their, you know, quote unquote, dirty laundry aired. Right. And so, you know, I, I think it's important to, to understand maybe when it is appropriate to use a grievance system to build power, right? You know, because maybe sometimes right. it's just not appropriate to 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 use a grievance to build power. Maybe maybe sometimes we just want to do it as as quickly and as you know behind the scenes as possible, so as to not embarrass this employee who had some sure. sort of issue, right? Oh, absolutely, yeah, and it, they're always kept private unless, of course, they want to, um, you know. But those are also good things as well, because not every issue is a unique situation. So if we're working a grievance, you know, with somebody who just wants to be kept quiet, uh, you know, we're learning what the company is going to do, what they're going to say. Uh, mm-hmm. So if in the situation of the future, we, you know, we have a much larger issue, we can use the same strategies. Uh, you know, and, and like you said, it doesn't necessarily have to be with discipline. I mean, there are things where the company is breaking the contract when it comes to like safe workplaces. Mm. Um, there was a time in this call center a few years ago as well, where um, it seemed like every, it was every Friday afternoon at a certain time, like three o'clock or something like that. Um, I don't remember the exact time. It's been so long since we've been in the building, but um, they would, as a test, they would fire up the emergency generator. Um, in case of power outages and stuff like that, just to make sure that they could keep running. Um, that emergency generator is diesel. Uh, so when they would fire it up, all the fumes would come out of that generator and that generator was right near the intake for our climate control. Mm. So whether it was heat or whether it was air conditioning at that time, every Friday, you know, people were starting to get dizzy because noxious fumes are coming into the building. Uh, so that was definitely an issue that we had to take up and make sure that, you know, the safety of our our members and the workers is the utmost concern. So we had to make sure that that was taken care of as as well. So there's many things, you know, and like I said, uh, not necessarily um, when it came to that pay that they missed out on, that wouldn't have been a disciplinary grievance, but contractually they were required to make a payment or a paycheck to us every two weeks. So that would have been something we would have had to take care of. Luckily we didn't have to file a grievance and we got our money on time. Um, But you know, that would have been also something we would have done. Right, right. And so that's, that's a good, you know, I, I hadn't, I hadn't thought about that exactly. But but that's a good point that some some of the times when there's a grievance that is um, that, that, you know, the employee does want to keep under wraps, so to speak. Uh, that can be a good learning opportunity for, uh, for the union to, you know, take yep. some tactics into into another maybe more public fight potentially. But when you are when you're looking at um, at grievances, how w- what are some things that you think about when you are deciding whether or not this needs to be a public fight and this needs to be or and whether or not this is an opportunity to build power in the union? So, you know, one of the important things for me as an organizer is, and and stewards, of course, and any kind of a strong union is going to be, you know, you're going to have the core group of people. You're going to have the, you know, the e-board, you're going to have the stewards. Um, It's a lot of work for just that amount of people. Um, So as an organizer, we are always, you know, we got our, our soldiers on the street, right? So we're listening to what they're saying, any issues that are arising, and like I said, with that paycheck thing, I mean, my phone was off the hook at 7.30 that morning. So as a powerful local, as a powerful union, 
um, we need to listen uh, to what's happening to our members. Um, and of course, if there's enough of a concern, those are one of those things that, um, you know, we're going to make sure that's very in the open and, and, and we're very vocal about it. But then also situations where, you know, maybe there's a change of policy and people aren't aware of the policy that's changed and it's starting to cause issues with discipline. Um, as a whole, we're going to make sure, um, you know, if it's affecting a lot of people, the same issue, that is also something that we're going to, you know, make sure it's pretty public for everybody, just so that they're aware of situations. We always want to make sure, you know, we'll, we'll update the, the membership monthly with, um, you know, first we'll request concerns, issues or whatnot, and then we'll bring them to the management. And then of course we need to, you know, make sure all of our members are aware of what, what was discussed in those meetings and any kind of a resolution that happened. So um, that's, I mean, any, any one of them that's going to affect a lot of people um, or if the company is just being blatant and disregarding the contract, that is when we need to make it more public. And, you know, we start to do things where, you know, not necessarily filing agreements, but it used to be, uh, you know, in the building, there would be times where we would all stand up at the same time. Uh, on Thursdays, CWA always wears red. Uh, so we do things to make sure that the company is aware that we are still there. Mm, right, right. And I think that, uh, you know, is there anything else that, that you wanted to make sure that you hit uh, from from that second workshop before we let you go? I think we got it all. I mean, I think it's going to be a great time. Um, we're going to have a lot of fun. Like I said, the most important part for me is you know hearing other people uh, and their experiences. That's the best part for me. I know when we left Labor Notes, we were ready to storm the gates. <laughs> uh, so we're hoping that's going to be the same feeling everybody gets this time as well. Yeah, I think so. Uh, Matt, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much for talking to us. Very welcome, Jacob. It was my pleasure. All right. Uh, so next up, I have Isaiah Thomas. He is an organizer with the Bessemer Alabama Amazon Union effort with the Retail Wholesale and Department Store Union. Isaiah, thanks for taking the time to talk to us. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. So you are going to be on a, a panel on Saturday about uh, race and labor and how we can talk about that, how, 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 how racism affects our organizing, how it affects our day-to-day -day relationships, and, and just the whole thing, because racism is, is a very big part of our society. And, and so it's, it's going to come up. It's going to come up in our organizing. It's going to come up in our unions, in our leadership, in our membership. And so how do we address it? That's what the panel's about. And so, you know, just starting off, we, we, we can just start off with <clears throat> addressing it in the context of an organizing campaign. If you're trying to form a union in a workplace, uh, what are some of the ways that racism might... Um, might show up in that context and, and how can uh, a, a union activist, uh, how can a union activist and a workplace committee fight against that? So the, the first and obvious way of how racism pops up in an organizing effort is through the techniques that the bosses use to actually prevent us from actually want, like forming our union. I've seen it with my own eyes at Amazon. They hired these consultants, which worked with the most like blatantly racist coworker of ours. I mean, like straight up neo-Nazi to convince other white workers that it is not in their best interest to form a union and that the union is nothing but, you know, a, a, an outside group coming in to disrupt what you already have. And so having to talk to your coworkers to realize what the company is doing purposefully to try to prevent any kind of solidarity and any kind of momentum inside the facility to form, to bring about real fundamental positive changes. It, it goes to show how power dynamics also play within race. And then when you're talking with your coworkers who there are some of my coworkers who are blatantly racist, such as the one who was used as a pawn by the company. 
Mm-hmm. And how do you address that? especially when having organizing conversations with them, trying to, you know, get them on board with wanting to form a union, why it's important to form a union. It's nine times out of 10, race is going to come up because there's some folks who are like, well, you know, this, let's say immigrant per se, even though they they don't even know if they're an immigrant or not, they'll just assume. And you have to, you have to catch that. And I'm not saying that it's going to be easy. It's going to be an easy conversation. It's going to be tough. It's going to be uncomfortable because you're talking with somebody who actually doesn't view another person as equal, mm. or maybe they're just like ignorance is a, is a real thing. And how do you overcome ignorance is by talking to people to get them to realize that that other person over there who may look different than you is nowhere near different than you because they have to pay bills. They have to take care of their kids and they have to show up to work too. There's nothing that's, that's different between us only other than, you know, the fact that the company is trying to push these differences between us and whatever other outside examples that come in to actually want to actually prevent us from coming together. And so in, in the context, to put it in the context of actually winning and addressing it in the organizing committee, using it as a method to teach one another of how to address the race issue and racism inside the workplace. It, you have to have folks educated on approach. Like you have to approach people in a way to where they don't think that you're that you're trying to start a fight. Because there are some of my coworkers who, when you're like, "Hey, man, that's racist," like like someone right. says something that's blatantly racist, and you're like, "Man, that's racist." Some people take it, you know, like they mm-hmm. get very defensive about it, and it's like, "Well, what you said is wrong, and we need to rectify this because." you're actually hurting other folks and you're preventing us from coming together as a union to do something that would benefit all of us. And at, at the same time, when you have the company instigating it, Mm. it, it's another challenge you have to get around because it's, it's the power dynamic that comes with it. And so not only are you overcoming a social ill such as racism, but you're overcoming the power dynamic that's tied with it. And it makes me think of, um, there's a quote from W.E.B. Du Bois about the psychological wage of whiteness, Mm. which is where white workers, and he was talking about in the terms of the South, white Mm. workers have sacrificed solidarity for this idea of having a social social authority over, over other workers and other people who are in the same ladder as them rungs of the ladder of the social hierarchy they could be poor white folks and they're poor black folks but because the ruling elite have such power in the context of the south but all over the united states but in the context of the south they use that power whether through the media or through the workplace to actually prevent workers from coming together and they use the color of their skin to make that justification. Right, right. Now, I I remember reading that and thinking that that was, um, you know, thinking that that was pretty profound and a, you know, a really good explanation of why it is so, why bosses will try to use that so often and and right. even even beyond the race issue but just thinking about a, a psychological wage that maybe you get instead of a uh, instead of a real wage you know we we hear about <clears throat> I, I know of several workplaces where if you're promoted into management uh, you actually make less than the union workers and so why just on a practical you know <laughs> right. if you're just, if you're thinking about it from a like rational self-interested free market weirdo right why would you ever <laughs> want to be promoted 
quote unquote. Right. And it's because you get this psychological wage of, of being a manager, of being a boss, of being in right. charge of other people. <laughs> and there's a similar thing happening there with, uh, with, with racism. You know, as yeah. long as I can be, even if it, even if I'm not, um, if I can't point to any material ways in which I'm better or my life is made better by uh, castigating this other group of people, I can feel like I'm better. Right. And that's, you know, that, that's something that, that's pretty difficult to fight against if people are really dedicated to, to getting this psychological wage. <laughs> right. And like the approach, not only is the problem intersectional, the approach also has to be intersectional as well. Because I know that there are some folks, especially people of the same politics as me, they can be um, class reductionists, but the, mm. we have to take it further because all of these things play in, in part together and they work together. And so how is it that we can get folks to overcome that psychological wage of whiteness, right? Is by it, it honestly, it's by, you know, exposure to the fact that your other coworkers are going through the same things that you're going through. And mm. I like how you mentioned how if they get like a managerial position and they don't get paid as much as union workers, it's an example of like the Stanford prison experiment. Mm. <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's an obstacle that we have to learn of how to actually get that shit out of the way because it's, it's hindering us from performing any kind of collective action that would be that is for the better of all of us. And the only way that we can actually get rid of it is through praxis, through talking with our coworkers, actually confronting it where it is, instead of pushing it to the side or ignoring it. And we have to have those uncomfortable conversations with them. How have how receptive have have people been? You know, you mentioned that this is not a this is not a, an easy conversation. But, you know, I, I think that that you have um, even though you're you're younger than I am, I think that because of the nature of of, of the organizing work that, that you've done, you you've actually had the opportunity to have more of these conversations with people and how how receptive have, have folks been in, in your experience to, you know, that correction, um, when, you know, when they do a racism, right. And you're like, Hey, you know, you <laughs> like you did a racism right. a little bit there. Um, you know, right. <laughs> how have those conversations gone usually? It has been, I'm not going to sit here and tell you it's like, Oh, everybody's like, Oh, you know, I realized I, I just did racism. So. Right, right. Oh, you just uh, undid 30 years of, of learning. Right. You know, like, right. Yeah. Well, it I'm is. not a racist anymore. Right. <laughs> it's a working progress. Like, there are... So, to give context, the facility I work at, the Bessemer facility, is 85% black, mm. and the rest of the percentage is white folks. And how I, cause how I approach the situation also due to the fact that, so I'm mixed. So I, people can't tell that I'm biracial, that I'm, you know, black and white. And so some of my coworkers who are black, they're uncomfortable talking with some white coworkers who say some racist stuff. Right. And so that's where I feel like I have to step in and be like, okay, let me have these conversations. And when I have these conversations, they're, like I said before, it's, it's a constant effort of trying to get them to, to realize that what they're saying is harmful and that it's actually preventing us from forming our union. And it, it's crucial that you have more than one person talk to this person mm. because I alone sometimes may not be the person to change that person's mind. Sometimes it has to be somebody else. And so when you're organizing, you identify who the leaders are and who they pull. Sometimes the person that you're talking to who is 
racist or does a lot of dog whistles, for example, they actually may be a follower of a leader inside the shop who Mm. let's say is not, you know, who doesn't condone this stuff, but the person who says the dog whistles look up to this leader, right? If you find out who that leader is, who can actually talk to this person, then that's another option of trying to, trying to get them to overcome that, that, that bigotry, but also solidarity on the work floor and them seeing that we're coming together and we're actually bringing about positive changes that's also impacting their life. Maybe that can also help them overcome their prejudices because they're seeing, Mm -hmm. okay, these other folks, which are multiracial and they're multi-generational and they're coming together and they're bringing about positive benefits that I see impacting my life. Maybe I was wrong. And so Mm. it's a multi-pronged approach. It's not just like one and done situation and one and done strategy. It's multiple strategies of trying to help people get overcome whatever bigotries or prejudices that they may have. And so, you know, moving into conversations about how, you know, from conversations about how racism affects our organizing to conversations about how racism can affect the structure of our unions and how we can hold, you know, leaders, um, quote unquote, accountable. You know, there's been a recent, um, there's been something happen recently uh, with the Los Angeles Labor Federation, the there was a uh, there were a couple city councilors. The president of the L.A. City Council um, was saying some. Uh, she did a racism. She did a she did a big racism, right? And yeah. like, I mean, it was really really ugly and 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 disgusting. And it was said in the Labor Temple, in the house, literally okay. in the House of Labor. Uh, of Los Angeles with the president of the LA Labor Federation there. And, you know, this is, that is something that is so disappointing to see as somebody who is, you know, uh, an officer of of the Labor Council here in North Alabama, you know, the idea that, that somebody who's representing, you know, tens of thousands, maybe a hundred thousand or more union members right. is, is allowing these conversations to take place in his presence inside of, of our house. Um, it, it is just, it is just disgusting. And, and so he has, he has right. resigned as, as a uh, labor federation president. And I, and I'm, I'm not sure if he's resigning from his office in the teamsters, but um, you know, this is, this is something that th- this is not the first racist conversation that he's been a part of. You know, it can't have been. Yes. He's like 50, 60 right. years old. He's been in the movement a long time. You know, who knows how many people he's he has participated in conversations with, made made racists feel comfortable in his presence and, and participated in that right. kind of thing. And, you know, how much damage damage has he done that we are we are not privy to? Um, right. And and so you know, I, I guess just your thoughts on, on the situation and how we can um, foster a foster a a culture of you know holding our leaders accountable. Yeah. So I mean, this is a, a good example of the a replication of the social ills and the the hierarchical society being replicated inside of you know the labor movement and i think the best way that we can overcome that to prevent that replication because we live in a society and i hate to say because i know you know we live in a society but we live in a society where it is hierarchical and that actually produces racism and that in order to keep those social controls in place, the ruling elite will use anything to actually 
prevent us from coming together and forming a labor movement that would actually bring about real change for everyone. And so in terms of what happened in LA, it's replicating and it, how we how we prevent that from happening is by having a grassroots momentum of the the membership. I mean, because the membership has to hold them accountable and we have to rally those folks at the ground level to say that this is not OK and we're not going to accept this and actually put forward a a, a grassroots program of democratic accountability where we can actually remove these members easily like one member one vote Mm. and uh, there has to be like a recall of some of these represent like it, it has to be easy to recall these representatives if they're if they're this problematic <laughs> i mean because being able to have that ability to hold power and you're you're putting forth this garbage of racism and saying some stuff that's very uncomfortable uh, it shouldn't be allowed especially with the fact that what we're creating here in the united states with the upsurge of the labor movement we cannot allow that to continue yep yeah i uh, totally agree um is there is there anything else that that you think is, is you know important to to pull out in in this conversation about race and labor before we let you go? Yeah, um, folks, it's it, it's not going to be it, it's it's not going to be easy mm. when we when we talk about forming a union when we talk about revitalizing the labor movement here in the United States. And when we talk about bringing forth the policies that we want to see to help out everyone, we also have to address the race, the racism and the bigotry that still exists in our society. You know, I'm, I'm very anti-capitalist and I'm very radical. <laughs> and in order for us to you know, get rid of capitalism in that strive to get rid of capitalism and to form a new society where there is no poverty and people actually do have a say in their workplaces, but also in their governments. We also have to look at the other intersectional issues that affect us, such as racism or sexism or any kind of xenophobia that prevents us from having any kind of unity and solidarity because it's important for us to have unity and solidarity to bring about the things that we really care about that we want to see changed. And so these conversations are not gonna be easy and in an organizing context and when you've already have an established union context, always try your best to, to be involved in forming that grass, grassroots movement to have accountability and to have that process of showing unity and solidarity and talking to those coworkers who may have, you know, bigoted viewpoints or prejudices. Isaiah Thomas, <clears throat> Isaiah Thomas, worker at the Bessemer, Alabama, Amazon facility, organizing a union with RWDSU. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, man. Which side are you on?